Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Heart Health with Michelle. I have someone I'm so excited to introduce, Dr. Thomas Dayspring. He is so well known in the lipidology field, and he ha- he's double sort- board certified in internal medicine and in lipidology, and he's just a wealth of knowledge, and I'm so, so excited to have him today. Um, Dr. Dayspring, can you talk a little bit about yourself and your, ex- your amazing knowledge and, and everything? that you know. Give us a little intro, please. Uh, sure, Ken, and it's a uh, thrill to be invited to, to your little uh, podcast here, Michelle. So uh, as has been indicated, and if you're looking at me now, you know I'm no spring chicken. I just didn't graduate med school last week. Uh, I actually had 37 years of clinical practice uh, as an internist, and for much of the final 20 years of that, it was specializing in the field of lipidology. I also had the opportunity to start doing uh, lipid educational uh, lectures, you name it. And I've had the privilege of lecturing over 4,000 times in all 50 of the great United States and several countries around the world. I've been lucky enough to publish many articles, textbook chapters in the science that I really love lipidology. And uh, amazingly, that's a, a if you t- go up to a Anybody and say, hey, I'm a lipidologist, they look at you bizarrely, like, what in the world is that? And obviously, it's a medical doctor or somebody with great expertise who knows something about lipids. A brief definition, lipids are organic molecules that are absolutely essential for life, but they're sort of oils, uh, meaning they are not soluble in water. The lipids that everybody probably has heard about are cholesterol, uh, fatty acids, or when fatty acids stick together, they're called triglycerides. Few have ever heard of the other type of lipid called phospholipids. But as you probably know, at least with cholesterol, it's considered a major league risk factor for the development of hardening of the arteries, which we call atherosclerosis. And in almost every country in the world now, atherosclerosis is the leading cause of death. So I always like to semi-tease a new patient or somebody I'm lecturing to. I hope it's many years down the road, but when we all do finally pass, the odds are real high that on line one of your death certificate, the doctor is going to write atherosclerotic heart disease, cerebral vascular disease, or atherosclerosis something. So If you'd like to uh, achieve longevity and you'd like to not only reach old age, but not be disabled with heart complications or God forbid stroke, then you have to understand, maybe I better understand the risk factors that predispose me to atherosclerosis. And there are several, uh, and we're going to be focused on the lipid aspects of with me doing the speaking today, but What's the number one risk factor for atherosclerosis? Age. Don't get old. We're still working on how to stop that clock, but we're not anywhere near doing that yet. So we are all going to age. But there are some old folks who don't get atherosclerosis. So why not? What are the other major league risk factors? I wish nobody was still doing it, but there still are too many smokers in the world out there. That Next to age, that probably goes right to the top of the list. You can throw in gender somewhat, and men usually get atherosclerosis maybe a decade sooner than a woman would. But by the time they're past menopause, atherosclerosis goes right to the top of the list of things that are going to injure or knock off women also. So uh, maybe you have a little protection for a little while as a woman, but uh, I wouldn't bank on that. The third thing would be hypertension. I'm going to talk a lot about lipids today, but hypertension is equal to lipids as far as damaging your arteries and predisposing you to cardiovascular complications. Yeah. And so that's just a to find you, of, so not to stop you, but hypertension, high, it's a high blood pressure, right? So Correct. just to, just to make sure the audience knows high blood pressure, which has been getting different definitions recently, and we've been tightening up those numbers too. Um, I don't mean to interrupt you. You have a wealth of knowledge and I want to share with everyone. But I think one thing that we had spoken about in, in a previous time together was you mentioned how 
I, one of my missions is to reduce the burden of cardiovascular disease globally. And you said, well, our risk assessment sucks. So this is why I'm so excited to have you kind of define all these things. But if you can get one more step granular, when you say high blood pressure, what is your ideal number? What are we looking to aim? How do we even assess it? Cause it's not a um, it, lipids. We can, you know, take a blood test, have a very defined number, but hypertension fluctuates. So how do we look at that? Because that is a big factor. And I want to make sure people are being proactive. Very crucial. And it's really actually easier to monitor than lipids nowadays. Lipids, you're going to have to go to a clinic or a blood draw station and have somebody take a blood specimen, send it to a lab, and a day or two later, you'll get the results back. Right now, many internists, especially if they, on their encounter, see it's a little borderline and they're not sure what the level is, they advise home monitoring of blood pressure. You can go to virtually any pharmacy in America, and very cheaply, you can go to Amazon and order a home blood pressure apparatus. They are idiot-proof. It's a simple little cuff you put on your arm, snugly, instructions come how to do it. You press a button, that cuff blows up and it tightens down on the arteries in your arm, transiently shutting off the blood flow, but then the pressure is released. And as the cuff expands, the, there's a sensor in that detects, ah, the blood is flowing through the arm again. And that would be the top number on your blood pressure. And then when the flow is even, that would be the bottom number. We call them systolic and diastolic, but you've probably heard, hey, 120 over 80 or 150 over 96. So what is perfect? It's funny, if you would have done a lipid talk with me 20 years ago, I would tell you, here's the desirable lipid concentrations. Well, they're incredibly lower today than they were 20 years ago. And the same thing, when I was back in early practice, the type of blood pressure that was acceptable then would be considered semi-malignant nowadays. Yeah. So our blood pressure desirable levels have shrunk also. In general, just to say, I wish everybody had a systolic, the top number under 120, 130 at the max, maybe occasionally, and the bottom number 80 or below. And if it's not there, if it's above it, that is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Like lipids, it's not something that will kill you next week, but over time, risk factors wind up doing their damage. And trust an old man, that clock does go by very quickly or so. So blood pressure, and those are the numbers you should look for. Uh, home monitoring is great. You know, sometimes when a person runs to a doctor's office, you know, a little Anxious, apprehensive yeah. and the blood pressure is a little borderline or something at home, that shouldn't be the case. So you can really check it periodically. And then you can actually alert your doctor that here's what my BP is running. Many doctors nowadays like uh, the patient to do it. They'll tell you how often, but bring in a log when you come in so I can see because as Michelle said, it's variable. You might have a somewhat bad day today, but for the next six days, it's perfect. Okay. But we would see a trend there. So blood pressure is very crucial to monitoring. The lipids, you're going to go get that tested periodically. And if out of whack, somebody will advise you and you will do whatever's necessary to control both blood pressure and lipids. And that may be just some lifestyle adjustments, eating better, throwing a little activity into your life. Of course, stop the smoking review of other supplements or something you might be taking, some of which can aggravate these parameters. Uh, but, and this is a big shift too, you must realize because the goals of blood pressure have gone down so much. And when I talk about lipids, the goals that are desirable nowadays are so much lower than they used to be many, many people do require pharmacologic therapy to control blood pressure and our lipids. Thank goodness most of our current therapies are incredibly safe with very little downside. Uh, but we do know, and this is a true statement, the sooner you know about blood pressure, whether it's in childhood, adolescence, or young adulthood, the sooner you know there's a lipid abnormality at any age, the sooner somebody takes care of it with one of those therapeutic avenues I've suggested, that's how you really prevent atherosclerosis. You come to me as a 50-year-old lady or man, and I see a lipid, I can certainly help you, but you've had 30 years of 
these bad risk factors are already chewing away at your arteries. So you're not dealing with normal people when they show up as adults, but still salvageable. Definitely. So you mentioned age, you mentioned smoking, you mentioned hypertension, and then I'm guessing the fourth is we're going to get into lipids. Yep. Okay. And uh, those are the big things. I mean, there are obscure rare things if there's some genetic history, but yeah, lipids are going to go forefront. And the great thing about lipids like blood pressure, very modifiable. Mm -hmm. So when we, so lipids are um, a topic of, of, an, of its own. So you go to an internist, you get your cholesterol panel. How do, what's the next step? So how do you a maybe read them, but also when is it the time to consider going to a lipidologist versus a cardiologist? I mean, I know in my practice, a lot of times people don't even know what a lipidologist or that there is such a thing. And I think it's a really important role in the whole, you know, risk assessment standpoint. Um, so how, how do we know when to go see a lipidologist? Uh, great question, of course. First of all, lipidology, as I indicated, is just a specialty of internal medicine where a doctor has taken additional studies, education on understanding lipids and its relationship, not only to cardiovascular disease, lipids affect other organs in the bottom too. But that person has special expertise. Just like if you need a knee replacement, you go to an orthopedist who's expert in the knee. Well, if you have a lipid abnormality, and it's kind of amazing because it is like the number one risk factor for the number one disease, that it's kind of shocking how little training the average physician or clinician uh, actually gets in uh, uh, li lipids or the understanding of lipids. They all usually get what's called the lipid panel, but most of the time you have to go behind that. But if somebody does do a basic evaluation of lipids and there are abnormalities there, hopefully that physician or clinician is astute enough to know hey, I don't just tell you your lipids are borderline, we'll keep an eye on it. That maybe repeat them once to make sure that it's a persistent abnormality, but then that clinician should be at least talking to you about lifestyle, referring you to uh, somebody who's more expertise in distinct lifestyles that may be appropriate or not appropriate for you. But at a certain point, he should say, oh, well, that lifestyle isn't working. I may have to use some basic drugs to get your BP or lipids under control. And if there's any trouble controlling those, that's where he has to think, like he would a, a regular internist, if your heart was beating crazy, he might say, I gotta have you see a cardiologist. If lipids are out of whack and they're not responding like they should, that's when he should think about a lipidologist. The other circumstance would be when you get that lipid screening test, and it comes back with such grossly abnormal, nightmarish numbers, that's pretty much beyond the average clinician to know current up-to-date, how to approach it, what other tests are needed, and you get into much more complex therapeutics in that area too. And the last thing I'll say, look, right now, every adult should get their lipids checked at least once a year. Most guidelines suggest that. But even the pediatric guidelines say at least starting around age eight, every child needs a standard lipid profile. And you say, what? Eight-year-olds aren't getting heart attacks. Well, there are a few who do because they have genetically inherited a malignant lipid disorder. But lipid disorders, until they cause a heart attack or stroke, cause you no symptoms. So you have no clue whether you're walking around with scary at-risk lipids or not. If a kid has inherited a genetic ability to grossly elevate his lipids, uh, that kid needs a lipidologist because they actually start therapies for the very few children who have such levels. So get your lipids checked, make sure the doctor gives you a coherent explanation of what's going on. And if there seems to be trouble explaining it or getting you under control, you, you, there's the American Board of Clinical Lipidology. You can Google who's the uh, lipidologist in my area. There are thousands of them now. Lipidology requires intensive study beyond family practice, internal medicine, uh, physicians, even gynecologists who do women's health. Some of them are certified. So uh, understand 
lipids has its own specialist, as does virtually every other aspect of medicine. If you're an asthmatic, you're probably going to a pulmonary guy. So we lipidologists are out there. And I said a few moments ago, prevention is everything. Yeah, if you survive a heart attack, we can try and prevent the next one. But you're now walking around with a damaged heart. If it's a stroke, you're walking around with a damaged brain. Far better to prevent that. Definitely. So I, I should I think, now just. Yeah, no, to no sorry. To, to, yeah, no, we'll get there in a second. So I just wanted to emphasize, I think people get shocked when you see these studies that eight year olds or 10 year olds have atherosclerosis. They have that plaque formation in their arteries at such a young age because we don't realize it's a progressive disease. And like you said, it's silent. So we can't we don't know that it's happening, but it's silently doing damage to our arteries. And then when there is a stressful event, inflammation, when there is a trigger, that's when it can cause an incident. So we want want to be very preventative and we want to make sure that we know our lipids and we don't, you know, there's a lot of, um, not, not scientific people out there saying, oh, well, LDL doesn't matter. And your cholesterol doesn't matter. And that's further from the truth. We need to be proactive and really be getting our guidance from individuals who have this expertise like you do in ensuring that we're getting those under control, um, and seeking additional help when those lipids are abnormal. So thank you so much for saying that, because I don't think people stress enough. Oh, okay. I'll, I don't want to do a statin. There's other therapies, but you need to have a conversation of why those might be, might be needed in certain situations. Um, like you mentioned, if it's very abnormal, it might be familiar hypercholesterolemia. We need to get that chicken. We need to get it addressed as soon as possible because it's a genetic metabolism disorder and just lifestyle alone usually isn't the only answer in order for it to therapeutically be within normal limits. Well, it's so true. And, 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 you know, those kids who unfortunately enough genetically inherit the type of genes that screw up your lipids, but even for those who may not have that extreme degree of lipid abnormality, even subtle lipid abnormalities start early in life. And I don't have to tell Michelle, there's an epidemic of childhood obesity, even childhood diabetes nowadays, which I never saw when I was training back in the late 60s and 70s. The only diabetics you saw were the type ones whose pancreas stopped working. But with this epidemic of obesity, sugar starts sneaking up on you. But almost all of those have abnormals in the lipids also. So those are the people who wind up with cardiovascular complications in their 20s and everything, because it's been going on already for a decade or two decades or so. So there's plenty of things that can sneak up on you that fortunately can be arrested. And the most scary thing of all to show you it is, we now, because of the Vietnam War, the Korean War, and even the recent uh, adversities in Iraq and Afghanistan, young soldiers get killed over there. And when they all get autopsied, And it is shocking how many of these young studs running around who a bullet took out when they cut open their hearts, a large percent of them have what we call subclinical atherosclerosis. They weren't going to have a heart attack anytime soon, but their their arteries were already being destroyed or building up this cholesterol laden plaque that's associated with atherosclerosis. So it's an early, early process, but that process does not occur if you do not have risk factors, and it does not occur if you have risk factors that have been brought under control with lifestyle or drugs. So it's never too early to get your lipids checked. And lastly, because I know there are going to be a lot of women listening to this, lipid evaluation is a crucial part of family planning. Don't even think about getting pregnant before you get your lipids checked, your husband gets their lipid checked, because lipids can contribute to morbidity during pregnancy in a big way and associated with adverse pregnancy outcomes. So you want to get all that checked before you go down that pathway. So it's never wrong to get your lipids evaluated. Amazing advice. I love it. Um, So I really thank you for this part one of our heart health talks with Michelle. Um, We're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to have everyone go check out part two, where we'll talk more in depth about the lipid profile and what to look for. Thanks so much for tuning in. And thank you so much, Dr. Dayspring for all of your valuable information. My pleasure. You're welcome. 